This morning's scripture is from the NIV version. First, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 through 20. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us, be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your fellow Israelites. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not an Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the Levitical priests. It is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites and turn from the law to the, to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. Our second reading is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 33. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Our final reading is from James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Well, today we have a guest preacher with us, uh, Chuck Zittle, who's been a longtime member here at First Free, uh, is going to be leading uh, the sermon here today. Chuck, come on up, join me up here on stage as we're going to pray for Chuck. Chuck is uh, a native to the Pacific Northwest. He's been born and raised here. Uh, you're going to hear a little bit about his family story, which is great. And one other thing about Chuck is he's a, he's a teacher. He's a Bible study leader. Uh, he leads the journey group here at First Church. In fact, if you have any questions about the sermon, he's going to have a whole time of discussion afterwards. They meet in the conference room and the journey meets, and you can go talk and ask questions and be a part of the discussion at the journey group today. Uh, and uh, I'm sure he'd love to have you. He also has been married to Sylvia and has a daughter, Olivia, who are here as well this morning. We're glad that he they are all a part of our church. And uh, so I know that you're going to be blessed today as you listen to this teaching because Chuck gives us a different perspective on, I won't say everything, but King Solomon, right? You're going to share some things about King Solomon I didn't even know about. I got to go back and study, do some more work. So, uh, but glad to be talk, have him talking about a king today. And uh, I'm going to, let's just pray for Chuck as he comes up here today. God, thank you for Chuck. Thank you for blessing him with insights into your word and we know that your word, the Bible, is always speaking to us, that if we want to hear your voice, God, we just need to listen to your word. And then we pray that as Chuck uh, explains what he's learned and explains these texts to us today, these, the word today, that your Holy Spirit would stir our hearts, that you would give us ears to hear what you want to reveal to us today. So God, would you speak to us today through Chuck's message? Would you say something to us that we desperately need today? And may your Holy Spirit be with each of us, whether online or in person today, in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a uh, pleasure for me to have this opportunity to speak to you, share what's on my heart. I have tremendous respect for what Matt has to do every Sunday, not only running the church, but getting prepared to give these messages. So, um, in 2001, Four days before the September 11th terrorist attacks, Jack Welch retired as CEO of General Electric and handed the reins of the company over to his chosen successor, 
a man by the name of Jeff Immelt. Jack Welch had run General Electric since 1981. He had grown it into the most valuable company in the world. In recognition of his achievement and management skills in 2000, year 2000, Fortune Magazine named Immelt Manager of the Century. Immelt had very big shoes to fill. Unfortunately, due to a series of unexpected events, timing, bad acquisitions, and management errors, things didn't go well for Jeff Immelt. During his tenure as CEO of, from 2001 to 2017, GE stock plunged 30%, losing $150 billion in value for its shareholders. And today, General Electric, the company that was once the largest company in the world, has dropped to such an extent that it's not even on the Dow Jones Industrial Average anymore. As I was preparing this message on the life of Solomon, I remembered an interview that I had listened to with Emelt earlier this year. He was contrite. He was sad about the mistakes he'd made at GE. But he also expressed a lack of awareness of the problems in the business until it was too late to stop the carnage. He wasn't Jack Welch, and he knew it. Have you ever had the same experience? Trying to be the successor of the successful in family, business, or career? I have. So a little bit of background about me. I grew up in Tacoma and was born the only son and the, only ch the youngest child by almost a decade in my family. A surprise baby, perhaps. I had three older sisters and another set of seven maternal cousins in Tacoma, and they were all girls. When I was born, a huge sign was placed on our house for the whole neighborhood to see, saying, it's a boy. Finally, a son in the family. Coinciding with being the only son in the family, my father was rising quickly through the ranks of the Tacoma Police Department. There he is in the middle, in uniform, looking very stern. <laughs> and by the time I was five, he was chief of police of Tacoma, president of the National Organization of Chiefs of Police. He was an alumni of the local university, University of Puget Sound, and was on their board of trustees. Through every stage of his life, he was a leader, high school, college, and now professionally. And most of all, I was his namesake. He was Charles, or Chuck, and I was Chucky. E. To family and to the friends of my parents, don't you start calling me that. Oh, there are privileges of being the son of the chief of police, in school, the bullies stayed away from me. My dad seemed to have tickets to every major sporting event and entertainment event in Tacoma, and I got to go with him. And I got to ride in a police car every day. My dad would often go to the police station early on Sunday mornings before church to do some work and check on things. And many times he took me with him. I was the son of the boss. I had the run of the place. Go to the jail? Yep. I knew where every candy dish was in the whole place. What fun. But what pressure to live up to the expectations of the son of the chief of police. Despite what you might think about the police today or about Tacoma, I'm proud to say my, to this day my dad's tenure as chief has never been besmirched by scandal or controversy. His track record as chief was impeccable. I love my dad and to this day I miss him. We had great fun hiking and fishing together throughout the Pacific Northwest. <clears throat> but he set a high standard for himself, and he had the same expectations for me. One of his mantras was, Zittles never quit. And he drilled it into me. Another of his mantras was, keep punching, which he got from Rocky Marciano. Keep going in the worst of circumstances. Never quit, keep punching. How could I ever look him in the eyes as a zittle and say that I quit something? I remember one time early in my driving career being pulled over on I-5 near South Center for speeding. When the state patrolman saw my driver's license, he asked me if I was related to you-know-who. As I responded affirmatively, 
he emphatically stated, well, you should have known better. To this day, one of the things that drives me is not letting my father down. Even though he's been dead for over 15 years and his memory as chief in Tacoma is gone, in my mind, I still have his reputation to uphold. We've been talking a lot about prophets in this series, so I thought it was time to choose another king. So I chose Solomon as my part of this message. To me, Solomon is one of the most interesting and enigmatic characters in the Old Testament. And as I was preparing for this message over the last few weeks, I thought this message was going to be one of downfall, lost potential, and judgment. And it does have those elements. But as I pondered Solomon's life, I couldn't help sympathizing with him and relating to him based on my own experience. If you're not familiar with Solomon, here's some background. He was the ninth son of David, Israel's greatest king. His mother was Bathsheba, the co-conspirator in a scandalous extramarital affair that was one of David's biggest mistakes in life. But when it was exposed, David repented of his sin. He married Bathsheba. David and Bathsheba's first child died at birth, but they had three more children together. Perhaps Solomon looked at his life as a young boy in the royal family and thought he was safe. He would never be king because of the many brothers ahead of him. The pressure to perform was off. But as is typical of God, the oldest or logical son wasn't chosen to be king. Solomon was chosen. Suddenly, the pressure is on, and he had big shoes to fill following King David. Here's just a list, short list, of some of David's accomplishments. He successfully transferred the leadership of the nation from the house of Saul to his own tribe, the tribe of Judah, and he established his clan as the royal family. He conquered the Jebusites, the original inhabitants of Jerusalem, and established Jerusalem as the religious center and national capital for Israel. He stamped out idolatry, practically speaking, and made the worship of Jehovah universal in the land. He eliminated most of Israel's enemies and extended the borders of the country to Egypt on the south and Euphrates River on the north and east, more territory than the nation has ever experienced. And after all these accomplishments, he had a final goal of building a house for God in Jerusalem, the temple that God had promised Moses where God would put his name a place of prayer where all nations would come to Israel to learn about this one true God. God prevented David from actually building the temple, but the Holy Spirit gave him the architectural blueprint. David passed that blueprint on to Solomon, along with providing him with most of the materials for the actual building project. And then he tasked him with the responsibility of completing it. The temple was to be the crowning achievement of Israel's exodus from Egypt, entrance into the promised land, and the conquering of its pagan inhabitants. With the building of the temple, Israel would arrive as a nation. Oh, and if that wasn't enough, God appeared to David after his death, after the death of his first son, and promised him that his descendants would be eternally kings, and that the promised Messiah would come from his descendants. So in the waiting moments of his life, when it was time to pass the torch of kingship to Solomon, Here's what David told him in 1 Chronicles 28. And you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire desire and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. Consider now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house as a sanctuary. Be strong and do the work. Big shoes to fill? Yes. But just two major goals for Solomon to accomplish. Stay in a right relationship with God and build the temple. Don't mess it up. In today's vernacular, you got this. So Solomon took over the kingship from David and led Israel into its golden years. We don't know Solomon's exact age when he took over the throne. Some people think he might have been 12 12 or 13. Others think he was in his 30s. Nevertheless, God blessed Israel exceedingly during his reign, mainly because of David and the promises that God had made to him. And God visited Solomon three times during his life. 
During the first visit, a nighttime visit, God expressed his pleasure with Solomon and gave him the opportunity to ask for anything he wanted. Solomon requested wisdom. But he didn't request spiritual wisdom. Solomon asked for human wisdom. Wisdom to manage the nation, to be a great CEO. Wisdom to not mess it up. God, God granted Solomon this request and, and became, the Bible tells us, the wisest human who ever lived. Wisdom not only for managing the nation, but also wisdom about other things, sciences and nature. But because he only asked for wisdom, God also granted Solomon wealth and a long reign. Solomon reigned in Israel for 40 years, the same number as his father David. And today, most of the lists of the wealthiest men who ever lived include Solomon. His annual income in today's dollars was almost $300 million a year. And his personal wealth at his death is estimated to exceed $2 trillion, dwarfing the personal fortunes of today's wealthy, Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates. After Solomon took over the throne, based on David's political warnings to him, he quickly eliminated all the external threats to his kingship, including the, uh, executing Adonijah, the oldest living son of David, who had presumed that he would be the one to be king. And Solomon set about early in his reign to complete the task he had been saddled with by his father, building the temple. The building project was completed in seven years. Israel has arrived as a nation, and in grand style, Solomon presided over the dedication ceremony. 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats were sacrificed. A huge barbecue was being held with enough food for all. And Solomon got to give the dedication speech but it wasn't a speech, but a humble prayer. God was so pleased with Solomon's prayer and the completed project, his glory came into and filled the temple. So everything's going great for Solomon, it seems. He has established his kingship, completed his assignment of building the temple. What is there left for him to do? God understands our vulnerability. I know in my life, I'm most vulnerable to turn my back on him when I'm successful or after a great achievement. The same was true for Solomon. At the temple dedication ceremony, God appeared to him again, and here's what the scripture said. When Solomon had, this is 1 Kings 9, when Solomon had finished building the temple of the Lord and his royal palace and achieved all he desired to do, the Lord appeared to him a second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. The Lord said to him, I have heard the prayer and plea you have made before me. I've consecrated this temple, which you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and heart will be there always. As for you, if you walk before me faithfully with integrity of heart and uprightness, as David your father did, and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your throne forever over Israel, as I promised David your father when I said, you shall never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. But... If you and your descendants turn away from me and do not observe the commands and decrees I have given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land I have given them and will reject this temple. Israel then will become a joke and an object of ridicule among all peoples. Can you hear the point of vulnerability at this time in Solomon's life? Solomon had just achieved all he had desired to do. God never had to give this type of warning to David. He knew David's heart. And God knew Solomon's heart and knew that he needed a warning at this time of achievement and success. In the Deuteronomy passage that Brian read, there were four specific commands for Israel's kings to obey in addition to obedience to the law of Moses. Those commands were, don't accumulate too many horses, especially from Egypt. Don't accumulate too many wives, especially foreign ones. Don't accumulate too much gold and silver for yourself. But most importantly, write a copy of this book, the book of Deuteronomy, and keep it with you and read it constantly. Why these special commands for the king? Well, the scripture says, so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees. 
and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites and turn from the law to the right or to the left. In other words, to keep David's second command to him, stay in a right relationship with God. When Jeff Immelt took over the reins of General Electric, he endeavored to accomplish more than Jack Welch. I know in my life, I felt the pressure to achieve as much or more than my father. Not necessarily as a police officer, that was never for me, but to achieve more in my career or avocations, to achieve the respect and admiration of others, and most importantly, the respect of my father. So what did I do? I went chasing after windmills, things that I thought would satisfy this hunger for achievement and the recognition that I craved. But they all ended up being dead ends. I won't go into detail about all these windmills, but as Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, all was vanity. But I'm thankful for the wake-up calls I had from the Holy Spirit along the way. As James once says, anyone who listens to the word and does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. I looked in the mirror that James tells us about, didn't like what I saw and came to my senses. One wake up call that was a turning point in my life is this. I had a friend who I was greatly admired when I was single, who I greatly admired when I was single. He was running a successful construction business. He seemed happily married and his wife was expecting their first child. And he was a bagpipe player and a fly fisherman two avocations that I also pursued. He seemed to have it all, or at least that what I wanted. Then one day, he went into his garage and blew his head off with a shotgun. I can vividly remember sitting in the sanctuary of University Presbyterian Church during his memorial service thinking to myself, if he did this to himself, where am I headed? If I aspire to be like him, I'm doomed. Thanks be to God that I had a Christian upbringing to fall back on, young life, and a fledgling relationship with Jesus Christ. That day marked a renewal of my relationship with Jesus. I started going to church, met Sylvia, started serious Bible study in BSF. I wouldn't be here in front of you today if not for that event. Despite all the tragedy and loss of his suicide, to this day, I thank God for the wake-up call it caused in my life. Solomon had his own opportunities for wake-up calls, the chance to see himself in the mirror of God's word. He just never seems to have woken up. His head is so down on the earth trying to outdo his father David in wealth, wives, and building projects, he never looks up to see God in his grace and mercy, the chance for a new beginning with him. By the time Solomon had finished the temple, he had already had two visits from God. Those were wake-up calls. But did Solomon ever wake up? Let's hear the rest of the story. In 1 Kings in chapter 7, we read, it took Solomon 13 years, however, to complete the construction of his palace. He built the palace of the forest of Lebanon, 100 cubits long, 50 wide, and 30 high, with four rows of cedar columns. It took Solomon seven years to build the temple, but it took him 13 years to build the temple to himself, his royal palace. And while the temple by design was rather small, just one part of Solomon's palace structure, the, forest of the, the palace of the forest of Lebanon was huge, about the size of a football field. Things do seem to be out of perspective, just a little for God and a lot for himself. And because of his lifestyle and the infrastructure he'd built around it, it cost a lot to keep Solomon's worlds functioning. But he didn't pay for that out of his own pocket. He asked the 12 districts that he created in Israel to do it for him. They were required to pay for his lifestyle for one month every year. Each district had its own month to take care of Solomon. This luxury tax became burdensome to the districts and would eventually cause a rift in the kingdom when Solomon died. God's blessing on Israel during this time was to make them a light to the nations, to attract those who didn't know Israel's God to come there, see the blessing, and to learn about him. And they did come. 
Now, didn't he only come to see the blessing, but also to consult with this wise man, Solomon? One such visitor was the Queen of Sheba. She traveled 1,400 miles from what is today Yemen to witness what she had heard about Israel and Solomon. She is what we would call today a seeker. At the end of her visit, this is what she had to say. 1 Kings 9. It's all true. Your reputation for accomplishment and wisdom that has reached all the way to my country is confirmed. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it for myself. They didn't exaggerate. Such wisdom and elegance, far more than I could ever imagined. Lucky the men and women who work for you, getting to be around you every day and hear your wise words firsthand. And blessed be God, your God, who took such a liking to you and made you king. Clearly, God's love for Israel is behind this. She came, she heard and saw, but was she changed? Solomon had the opportunity to tell her not only about the blessings of God, but also about the God who blesses, about putting her faith like Abraham in the promise of a future redeemer. Many years later, another visitor would come to Jerusalem seeking to know this God, the Ethiopian eunuch. Like the Queen of Sheba, she, he came and left Jerusalem still having questions. But God met him on the road home in the person of Philip. This eunuch heard the gospel, was baptized and returned home, a changed man. And how was Solomon doing in regards to keeping his obligations as king, outlined in Deuteronomy? Did he accumulate too many horses? 12,000 horses is probably too much. Did he go to Egypt to get them? Yes, he did. Did he accumulate excessive riches? Yes. Did he have too many foreign wives? We'll see in just a moment. Did he keep a copy of the law near him and read it day or night? Based on his obedience to these specific commands, probably not. Might he have thought his situation was special or unique? That he could justify his sin? Perhaps. But Lord, I have this big country and all these people to govern. I need this many horses and chariots and soldiers to maintain your order. But Lord, if the prosperity stops, I need all this gold for our financial security. But Lord, I need to make these political alliances with other countries, so I need to marry their daughters. And besides, my father David had multiple wives. Why can't I? What would Jesus say to Solomon? Consider the lilies of the field. They neither toil nor spin, yet your father takes care of them. Put your trust in him, not horses, gold, or foreign alliances. J. Vernon McGee, in his Through the Bible Commentary, often says that the cycle of nations follows a very familiar plan. Starts with a religious apostasy, then progresses to moral awfulness, and ends in political anarchy. This is true for Israel and the nations, but is also true for our own lives. Did Solomon's life fall in this pattern? As you grew old, was Solomon religiously apostate? Yes. Was he morally awful? Yes. Was there a political anarchy within Solomon? His heart was divided, not fully devoted to the Lord like his father David had been. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, lived was locked into a place I'm sure he never expected to be. If he could have woken up and seen his predicament, maybe things would have been different. But the chains of habit are so light, they cannot be felt until they're so strong, they cannot be broken. If this could happen to the wisest man who ever lived, it should be a warning to us. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. Solomon had more than two masters. This was the essential warning to the king of Deuteron in Deuteronomy, right? Don't be devoted to yourself as king. Be devoted to the king of kings. I titled this message, King Solomon, Great to Good for a Reason. A few years ago, I read a business book titled Good to Great, Why Some Companies Make the Leap and Others Don't. In the book, the author Jim Collins, a Stanford business professor, gave in-depth analyses into 21 companies that, in his opinion, had made the progression from just being good to being great. In his research, one of the most important factors was the leader, the CEO of the company. 
And each of these companies, they had what the author termed a level five leader. Here is the definition of a level five leader. Level five leaders display a powerful mixture of personal humility and indomitable will. They're incredibly ambitious, but their ambition is first and foremost for the cause, for the organization and its purpose, not for themselves. Was David a level five leader? Yes. Was Jack Welch a level five leader? Probably. Was Solomon a level five leader? At the start of his kingship, with the task of building the temple? Perhaps. At the end of his reign, with multiple foreign wives, worshiping foreign gods? No. He had digressed from being great to good, or maybe even worse. When he had reached the bottom, the pit of full-scale idolatry, God gave Solomon a final wake-up call. Here's what God said to him in 1 Kings 11. Since this is your attitude, and you've not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of your father David, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son, Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him. I will give him one tribe for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. At this final warning, did Solomon wake up? Like David, after his sin with Bathsheba, did, God go to, did he go to God, repent, and ask for forgiveness? No, he didn't. Instead, he kept going and, in, and tried to kill the insubordinates that God was raising against him. So what is the end of a sad story of Solomon? Did he ever wake up? At the end of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes here is this solemn warning. Perhaps it's a wake up. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. God fulfilled his warning to Solomon. The kingdom was torn from the hands of Solomon's son, Rehoboam, and divided into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. The political anarchy would continue in both kingdoms until God raised up the Assyrians to conquer the northern tribe and the Babylonians to conquer Judah and carry them off into 70 years of slavery. But God kept his promise to David and raised up one of his descendants, Jesus Christ, to be Solomon's and our Messiah. Jesus was great from the beginning. He became bad in God's sight on the cross to bear our sins. But then again, he became great three days later when he rose from the dead. Immediately by faith in what Jesus has done for us on the cross, we too can be good, become good in God's eyes, forgiven, redeemed, and restored to a right relationship with him. And by the power of the Holy Spirit within us, we can chart a steady course throughout our lives toward heaven. I'm so thankful that when I stumble, as I often do, if I wake up and confess my sins, God is faithful to start again with me. In Hebrews 12, we read, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. In my dad's words, keep punching, don't quit, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And in Romans 12, Paul tells us, don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. In other words, wake up. And enter, we, then we enter heaven to hear God say to us, well done, thou good and faithful service from good in our mortal bodies to great in our heavenly eternal bodies. May it be so for you and for me.